My name is uh, Yusuf Alimi. I'm a recent graduate from St. George's University, and I'm a clinical anatomy research fellow here at the Seattle Science Foundation. My topic today, I'm going to be talking about the clinical anatomy of the spirulina. It's a review paper I wrote uh, last month. It's, uh, it was accepted into the, it was accepted by the, uh, for publication at the Cl uh, Clinical Anatomy Journal. And uh, before I start, I would like to give a special thanks to Dr. Oskoyan, a CEO here at Seattle Science Foundation, and uh, Dr. Tubbs for giving me this opportunity to participate in uh, anatomical research here at the Seattle Science Foundation. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Iwan Agar as well for his uh, assistance with my papers and everything, and the research in, in the lab, and my fellow uh, fellows as well for your assistance, as well as Katie, the editor. So. First of all, my goal today is to enable and ensure that we understand uh, the anatomical knowledge of the spirulina and, and I'll see how we can apply this to patient care. You know, sometimes we all seem to forget that the cornerstone of medicine is anatomy. Anatomy is involved in everything. Without anatomy, you cannot do anything. So it's very important that we understand uh, the anatomy behind every, every uh, pathology and see how we can apply uh, knowledge to the patient care. I also like to talk about uh, uh, the whole patient approach, which basically for me involves, you know, you considering the whole patient, you just don't want to treat this patient's symptoms. You know, a patient presents you with pain, you just don't give the patient a medication and be like, yeah, you're gonna be okay. This patient might have other factors that might be causing this pain, you want to treat that, not just the pain. So that's what I, I call the whole patient approach. Um, this per union, it's, uh, it's basically the definition is right there. It's constant pain with uh, intercourse, and uh, it can be classified based on uh, uh, anatomical location, uh, entry or deep. So entry this per union is just uh, pain at the entrance into the uh, uh, vagin uh, vaginal introitus so around the vulva. Whereas deep this per it's all the way deep into the vaginal wall, all the way towards the, the cervix. That's the most common type of uh, classification that we have, but we also have uh, some other type of classification, such as you know, primary and secondary. So this is pretty much based upon when the patient first experienced the pain. So if it's primary, if it was upon initial, the very first uh, sexual intercourse, and it's secondary if it's later after uh, the first intercourse. So I like to uh, put pictures in my presentation because I, I think people remember this and it helps a lot. So as you can see right there, entry dyspareunia is basically at the entrance into the vagina and uh, around the vulva, that's where the pain is usually uh, uh, perceived. And then deep dyspareunia, it's pain all the way deep in the inner wall of the vagina all the way to the cervix and it can involve all the pelvic organs as well. So here, I just talk about uh, study, uh, the etiology of uh, dyspareunia. It's, it's that we have a lot of causes for dyspareunia, and it's multifactorial. A lot of factors can play a role, and the reason why you want to um, consider the whole patient because you don't know what might be causing it. Uh, a lot of biological factors or psychosocial factors, and uh, right here we also have the statistical data for um, Dyspareunia, so it's it's pretty common. Uh, the causes of dyspareunia, as you can see, uh, we uh, like I said earlier, the entry dyspareunia, we have a uh, vulvodynia, vulvovaginitis, uh, va vaginismus, and so on. For deep dyspareunia, you have the endometriosis is the m number one cause. You have other things such as adenomyosis, you know, vaginal scarring after radiation, pelvic adhesions, and so on and so forth. So it just shows you again, like I talked about, it's, it's a multifactorial disorder, so you totally want to be on top of it. And each patient is definitely going to be different. So just a basic anatomical review right here. Um, we have, uh, as you can see, we have a, 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 a vagina right there. We have a uterus, we have the vaginal wall, we have a rectum, we have you know, basically, it's a, it's a mid-sagittal section of the female pelvis. And right here, you just have a, a anterior frontal view that just shows you the vaginal wall and the cervix, and you know, just, just something to remind us of a basic anatomy. Talking about enterodyspareunia, 
you know, one of the main nerves that's involved is uh, the pudendal nerve, and it's something that tends to be involved. Why and why is it involved? It's because we, I, I said earlier that entry dyspareunia basically involves the entry, the, the vulva, and entry into the vagina. Guess what? It's the pudendal nerve that surprises uh, sensory and uh, nociceptive innervation to that area. So as you can see right there, the pudendal nerve from its uh, origin in the uh, S2S384 passes all the way right there. You know, it tends to give us an uh, inferior rectal branch right here to the rectum, which is not shown in this picture. And then it goes uh, all the way, passes through the pudendal canal, goes over here, gives us perineal branches, uh, that's a deep perineal branch, and the superficial perineal branch, which, tends to, which gives you the posterior labial branches where that supplies the labia. You also tend to, you also have a, a dorsal nerve right here, which is not shown in this picture, that uh, innervates the clitoris. So the pudendal nerve plays a big role, you know, in this area right there, which is why it's been, impli you know, it's been talked about a lot and implicated, you know, when it, we're talking about entry dyspareunia. One of the major causes of entry dyspareunia is uh, vulvodynia, and it's, you can see again, the stat statistical data, it's about 70% incidence. It's basically burning pain, hyperalgesia around the vulva, and um, it's uh, often dismissed as a psychological disorder, and it's been underreported because of that. It's been linked to uh, dysfunction in pelvic floor muscles, and uh, this is something that tends to be present in the most causes of dyspareunia. Um, like I talk about a multifactorial approach, women with vulvodynia tend to suffer from other chronic pain syndromes. So you want to consider all these things as well, just in case you never know. You just want to treat the pain of vulvodynia. So um, what, what causes vulvodynia? You know, it's something that we want to know. It, although it does have a multifactorial approach to it, what's what's the basic pathophysiology? You know, and uh, this paper uh, by Tim Panet is just, they came up with um, uh, something where they observed that they took uh, a biopsy of patients with vulvodynia and they uh, it went, underwent immunostaining, as well as uh, they used a neuronal marker to identify and see what the uh, nerve density is in the, in, in the uh, vulva tissue, and they observed that a, a, a quite significant increase in the uh, number of sensory nerve fibers and nociceptors present in the in the vulva tissue. So basically, the theory is this tends to be some sort of you know in, increased innovation around the vulva and increased uh, nerve density, which might play a role here in, in the etiology of vulvodynia. When we're talking about deep dyspareunia, um, uh, this just tells you again the different nerve branches of the pudendal nerve, as you can see right there, I talked about that earlier. That's just a better picture. And right here, I want you to pay attention to the pudendal nerve as it passes through the pudendal canal. Obviously, it gives us the inferior rectal branch. You can see it sits right underneath the, the levator ani, you know, and that is a, it's a very important muscle in the, in the deep pelvis. And it, patients that undergo pelvic surgery, and if you if you tend to you tend to put stress or that are cut through these muscles, you might you know compress or put stretch and stress on the speed and the nerve, which again is going to play a role right over here because you're compressing it right there. So there's been a lot of factors, you know, and people it's it's a, it's a big it's a big it's a big thing in the literature. People the speed and the nerve it's very important when we're talking about endospirinia, especially entry dyspareunia. Um, one of the major causes of this dyspareunia, again, is uh, endometriosis, and uh, it's well known. It's uh, incidence and uh, statistical data is right there. And again, you know, there's been research as to why why do um, patients with endometriosis have uh, dyspareunia? It's it's and there was a research published a, a paper published that talked about increasing nociceptive nerve bundles around the uterosacral ligaments, which tends which is where you tend to see these nodularities in patients with endometriosis. And it, they they published pretty much the same thing like I talked about for Volvodinia. They they noticed that there's an increase in nerve bundles uh, around the uterosacral ligaments where you have these nodularities in endometriosis in patients. And again, it's just increase in, in nociceptive fibers around that area that tends to sensitize these patients to pain and dyspareunia, obviously. So clinically, how do we diagnose this? It's very important that we, we do a, a good history and physical exam 
That's your number one. That's where you, that's where you, 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 you start from because every, every medical diagnosis, you have to take a good history as well as perform a good physical exam. Some patients might present to the physician and they might be embarrassed about talking about the situation. It's, it's a big honor on us clinicians to, to ask them the right questions so that they can talk, so that they can open up. And these are examples of questions you can ask them just to make sure that the patient talks to you. And uh, you, know, you wanna use open-ended questions, you wanna make sure that you get uh, ex uh, exactly what's going on with the patient. How do we manage uh, dyspareunia? Uh, again, it's based on the findings that we got from the history and physical exam, and you have to understand each patient is different. You have to understand the whole patient and the medical and psychosocial circumstances surrounding each patient. And you have to remember that there is no one treatment for dyspareunia, and uh, you want to treat the cause of the pain, not just the pain. My conclusion here is uh, basically, as you can see on the slide, it a big thing, it can have a negative impact on the quality of life experienced by the patient. And uh, although we need to understand the neuroanatomical structures involved in dyspareunia, it's, uh, it's of high clinical importance. You just don't want to treat the pain, you want to treat the whole patient. And I don't know if you guys know about this uh, social media called Whisper. It's where you know, people go and they post anonymous information. You don't know who posted, it's just, just pick your mind. And you know, this is just one I found, you know, Vovodinia and chronic pain has ruined my life. I can't cope anymore. It just it tends to show you that this is not just a pain, it's it's a whole thing, you know, and we we, t we have to take it seriously. And I guarantee you I didn't post this, okay? <laughs> All right. And uh, that's just the slides I used, uh, the papers I referenced in my in my presentation. And thank you very much, everyone.